And there goes uh, Frankie Vicente with uh, Au Top Das Le Le Ghetto. A vibe that comes from way back in time. I'm sure people who love this kind of soccer music, uh, the likes of Elder Hubbard, and um, a few people who have been there in time to appreciate what soccer music is like. So I got introduced to soccer music and rumba music by my father. He loved a lot of uh, soccer music and rumba and a little bit of uh, songs from the Mozambique in the days of the Frelimos. And that's how I picked the interest in this. But nonetheless, it always reminds me of one thing. We are such a unique being as human beings, and especially as blacks, we have a unique sense of music. My name is Andrew Chamagiro, and welcome to the Monkey View G, the soccer edition. <laughs> Someone sent a tweet and said, this is the soccer edition. And we have friends who are listening in from the Caribbeans, and that's why we had to, you know, give them a song to make them feel comfortable. In a way, this is the Monk of UG, and this week's um, space conversation is about me, myself, and loneliness. <clears throat> Excuse me, embracing the emptiness within. And colleagues, friends, comrades, in this meeting today or in this gathering, we are going to dive into a very silent whispers of solitude and the profound sense of emptiness that often accompanies our journey through loneliness as men. See, in the hearts of everyday life, where noise and chaos prevails, the feeling of emptiness can be very stuck, haunting contrast, leading us to confront the vast expanses of our inner selves. Now, this week we're exploring the void, not as an abyss of despair, no, but as a canvas of infinite possibilities, a place where the soul can breathe, heal, and grow. See, most men don't want to believe that emptiness happens, but emptiness oftentimes is perceived as lack of lack or absence, or holes within its seeds of potential and transformation. So what does this do? It beckons us to pause, reflect, and engage with our deepest, innermost, authentic selves. And through our conversations today, men, we are going to uncover how the emptiness of loneliness can be a very crucible layer for self-discovery. A silent mentor that guides us towards introspection and self-actualization. So whoever is joining us for this very Twitter space this morning, I really want to appreciate you. I want to thank you for the consistency. But above all, I want to thank you for showing up every Saturday. You have no idea how many people depend on this energy to sail through the week. You have no idea how many people wait for your submission, for your contribution to sail through the week. So as we are initiating this exploration, as we share experiences, insights, and perspectives on how to navigate emptiness, turning what may seem like an echoing void into a space of clarity, insight, and renewal. Together as men in this space, we're going to learn to sit with our solitude, to listen to our subtle messages, and to find within its depth the pearls of wisdom that will lead to a fuller and more connected existence. Man, listening to this conversation, get yourself a pen, and a book because the knowledge that is on this space i for one i can tell you it's very unique and it's very rare we have different walks of life that are going to impact you today so prepare this journey that not only acknowledges the emptiness but also celebrates it as an essential element of human experience so here in the month of ug we're going to embrace the emptiness within we are going to discover that within a heart of emptiness lies a vibrant pulse of your life, waiting to be embraced and understood. <clears throat> and just before we go any deeper, today we have the men's breakfast garage. It's happening at Hotel Africana. It's only 50,000 Ugandan shillings. To those who drink alcohol, it's only two buckets. Um, if you can invest in the two buckets, let's be there. It's going to be on the sixth floor BMK building at Africana. Let's be there. And shortly after this space, I, myself, Andrew Chamagiro, I'll be there speaking about the patterns and the patterns and the emotional intelligence we need as men. So it will be an honor to meet a couple of you and we have more conversations physically. But at the same time, it will be more gratifying to hear your stories. This is the man of UG and I won't host it alone. Today, my young brother, strong as he is, he's back with all the energy. Faisal, good morning. Good morning, uh, Tamagir. Oh my God, what I would give to be in the Caribbean because the heat, wow. <laughs> it's just too hard to live, but guys, my God. I've showered okay. twice tonight. <laughs> How does it feel to shower more often? <laughs> you see, at times they say that women, we don't love to shower. And I've always oh. told men that whenever you have a chance, please take a shower. How does it feel now? Ah, it's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> it's refreshing, but I, I kid you not, Chamaka. I don't know how people are doing it in this heat. 
it is hot. What do you mean doing doing it? Do, doing what exactly? No, ah, you, you see now we're in Ramadan, so I have no back. I I have no innuendos in any of my <laughs> in any of my sentences. I don't know how people are sleeping well at night. Yes, I don't know how people are sleeping at night while all, all under this heat. But uh, it's uh, good to be back. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait for this specific topic because this is something that they also preach to us during Ramadan: being one with yourself and uh, learning how to be in the company of just yourself and your loneliness. So yeah. Over to, back to you, Chamagir. Thank you so much, Faisal. We are going to request you, our dear man here, that you're going to request for the microphone and um, and you'll share whatever it is. It's a conversation, and we have designed this Twitter space as a conversation platform. In the intricate modes of these conversations, you find you. There is someone who will speak, and you feel like they have been spying on what you're going through. No, we are men, and we are lived experiences, so we won't hold it back. Mm. So about emptiness, um, as we're waiting for other people to request for the microphones, I'll share with you a time where I felt I was empty and I was lonely, yet I was surrounded by very many people. There came a time when I was, <clears throat> I think before we had the camp, um, and around the time we were having um, Chairman Kasinje launch his book, I was going through a journey of emptiness that was not understood except for a few people who were mentally informed that they were in position to understand what I was going through. But to all those that I used to speak to, I was the happiest. I never failed. I always showed up at every layer. I always made sure that I show up, but I was empty. Emptiness among men will always be read off as bored. You feel a sense of boredomness and you start to to look at life with a sense of tapping out. And we all go through that. The only problem is sometimes we're so egocentric to believe it. Sometimes we're so blinded to acknowledge it that I feel empty. And sometimes when some fellas tell us that I'm empty, you're like, what do you mean? It's not by accident that we don't know how to respond because it's it's weird. It's it's a feeling where you you just feel you're tired, you're bored, you you're not into this anymore. And that feeling happens oftentimes when you are mentally exhausted or when you're going through the first blues of of mental challenges. I'm grateful to have Stuart Raymond here because he deals with a lot of these um uh issues in mental health and, and, and stuff. So I was lonely, but please, guys, listen. At every part where I was lonely, I kept showing up at every bit of it, every layer. I showed up at every layer. Until one day, <clears throat> I think my boss sent me to do a story. And I got the team. I told them, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I got my camera guy. I got my producer and I got my camera, my, my car. And I told them, let's go to the field. So, but I told them I need a minute. And I went to the washroom on the sink and I, I just held the sink with water running. And I told myself, do I have to go to the field? Really? So I went to my supervisor and I told him, um, I know this is going to sound very weird, very, it's, it's weird, but I'm empty. I'm going to do this interview, but uh, rather story, but I don't believe I'll give it justice. And he asked me why I told him I'm empty. I don't know what happened to this guy that day. Up to today, I'm still mesmerized that he got a little bit of a blue that hit him, that he agreed. He agreed and said, okay, you can stay. And when I stayed, he again made it much more easier. And he said, Andrew, it's okay. You can take a rest. But even when they told me to take a rest, guys, I would be in bed, but I, I, I didn't have sleep. I, I was just there. I was hanging. Anyone who would move at night in the house, I would know. I would ask them, what's the problem? They'd be like, you don't sleep? I'm like, no, I sleep, but I, I just woke up when you're moving. My sleeping patterns changed. My eating behaviors changed. Food had lost taste. But beyond that, I kept showing up at the different layers. And it's that day when they told me that, you know what, just, just take some few days off. And I felt lonely beyond measure. 
today's conversation is going to require you to take a very intentional, introspective move within your life. Because I, I had no, listen, when you're lonely, you can't think. When you're empty, you can't creatively go through issues. Like you can hear people, but you can't see them. You can hear people say this and that, but for one or two reasons, you just can't see them. And I said, maybe it's just a blue, um, it will wear off one week, two weeks, one month. And then I said, I think I just need to talk to someone. And the person I talked to, um, she's my very dear friend. I just told her, you know what, Farida, this is how I'm feeling. Funny, the person I was talking to was equally empty as me. So we just took a drive. You know, the Mabira Forest, we have the side of um, the Rainforest Lounge there. We took a drive through those trees and when we reached there, this was the funniest thing. Before you branch off to go to the rainforest, we parked there and just sat on the ground, like down. We sat down there and we just, we just connected with nature, just there, silent, not saying a thing. We, we just sat there. It took us, um, because later we started that journey to make sure that we actually bounced back, but it took us closely to three weeks of repeated experiences that we could bounce back. But when I was empty, my spending was weird. I never said not whatever they wanted at home. We need this, fine, get the money. Da, 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 fine, get this. Oh, um, babe, I want to go with my friend. You go. Uh, like, I just didn't want to reason and rationalize anything. I am just empty. That happens to every man. And you as an individual who is here today, maybe you're going through that. You're at a level where nothing makes sense. It could be to your children. It could be with your spouse. It could be with your job. You are working every day, but for one or two reasons, you hate your job. Bro, you wake up in the morning, you jump in that Subaru, you get on that bike, or you sit in that taxi, but you get tired as soon as you reach. And that's the conversation we're having this morning. It will take you time to understand the emptiness of loneliness. And where does it come from? How do we engage it? I've come to know that the most happy people are the most lonely people. Previously, I thought I was an extrovert until I did a testing and I got to know that, oh, I am not. I'm actually an introvert. So these layers of loneliness, some people, the more they go quiet when they change in some patterns, we start to lose it slowly but steadily. You hate your job. So you're there to pay the bills, but your, your, your patterns or your bearing of the job, the why is no longer there. You just feel tired. And it's that conversation that I want us to take today that we can help brothers who are going through this. And in this space, I always tell us that there is no blame games, no victim cards. We are men. We are going to rip ourselves apart and we are going to bring ourselves together into one bond, one tribe, to make this work. This is the Man Cave UG. I will start off with um, Hansel Mugabe. Um, Ivan, have you ever undergone loneliness where you felt it's me, myself, and my loneliness? The rest doesn't matter. If you have ever, or if you've seen someone experiencing it, how did you start to notice that you're actually sliding to that? And later... It hits you that you're in the same pool. Over to you, Ivan. Ivan, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Okay, now, yes, now uh, we can. All right, thanks. Yeah, it's a very, very, very important topic, Andrew. Uh, but I will, uh, I will first of all highlight the layers of emptiness. Uh, some of these actually, in many ways, <clears throat> some of them actually in many ways stick to my life experiences, but some of them may be very general. They, they will relate to you know, each of us at one point in life. Andrew, there are times where emptiness may come, especially among men. It may come when we are looking at career, you know, 
carry aspirations, they, it, you know, especially where someone has a target to achieve. But then you sort of realize that maybe you are, your career aspirations are not aligning with your colleagues, maybe in the workspace, in work circles, you know. So uh, then you realize it comes to a point when you are in a crowd of people or in a, a space with work colleagues, <laughs> but you feel you're lonely. You know, it, it sounds ironical, you know, when there are people around you, but still you're in a state of loneliness. So, but uh, that, one of the, the, the drivers for that may be when your aspirations, when your ambitions, when your expectations are different from them. Now, but in other cases, Andrew, what could cause emptiness are day-to-day challenges which may kind of feel that we have hit rock bottom. Now, Andrew, I had a colleague, a fellow man, whom we used to work with uh, some time back before COVID. And when, uh, yeah, just before COVID, that year of 2019, yeah, 2019 uh, at work, they, he had a scandal. They, 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 it was alleged that he had a sexual scandal. So, of course, when they were investigating the scandal, they put him aside from work. So they posed him from work. Then they stopped his money. Then his wife said, but if these allegations are true, then we, we, we need, we, our family is not safe. We, we, we can't continue this way if these things are true. Now, so at that stage, when every layer from work, then to home, the home space, and then, of course, his other colleagues or friends were becoming so curious to know what was going on. He felt a sense of emptiness, and he was like, okay, these things don't make sense to me. They don't make sense anymore. So, and, and I remember as he shared with me, he was telling me, you know, I'm going through this, I'm going through this. And then I realized that emptiness can come as a result of the challenges we face. And this will vary from one man to another. You know, sometimes there could be, you know, an incident which has come up. It may be temporarily when maybe that during that season or that phase or that period when you are going through that experience, you feel empty and you feel no one is understanding you. Now, Andrew, again, I will also make a quick highlight that, you know, the time there was a time when I was out of this country and uh, that was probably for more than four or five years. And I sort of turned out that I met, <laughs> I met some Ugandans <laughs> in, in, in my walks of life. And these were fellow men. I remember talking to one guy, I, I won't mention names, uh, and he told me, so I, I met him, he was busy working, busy working and cleaning. I mean, in, the, in these Western countries, there are pubs, clubs everywhere. So after work, where I was working, I had a, a, a team of colleagues, they, they, they were, we used to sit in the same office where I used to do research. So they, and I think it's a common culture. After work, they say, okay, let's meet up at this, at, at this point. So while there, uh, this man came around, and when he talked to me, he was telling us to extend our chairs. So when I had his accent, I felt that this man comes from home. He must be Ugandan by descent or by origin. So I, I, was in, I was keen to talk to him. And when I talked to him, he was like, and I immediately, I kind of immediately, shot, I did a shortcut from, I talked to him in Uganda. Then immediately connected, he put the broom aside and he opened up, you know. But then as we talked, he was telling me that, you know, Ivan, for me, I'm feeling very empty because there are days I wake up and I don't feel like I have to go to work. And I feel like, you know, day in, day out, it's like a robot system, a roller coaster. Monday, Friday, you do the same thing. It doesn't involve any thinking, it doesn't involve any innovation, it doesn't involve, you know, any peace of mind, but you have to come, sweep and go, sweep and go. Then I asked him, and then he said, but on the other hand, I have a family back home in Uganda and I need to support it. So I, 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 I told him, well, but that is a sense of emptiness. It's not going to be permanent. It, it, there will be a time when you will be able to move on. And I mean, I mean, I, I, we are still in touch with him even today because he engages me on WhatsApp. And, and, and the other day he was telling me he had managed to go back into college. Now he's probably into a more, more better job, he's in sales. And his pay, and his pay is much better from what we call a minimum wage, which was earning like, the, previous, the past time. So, Andrew, the, the, it's the first emptiness can be seasonal. There is when it comes and it hits you hard. And we've uh, both experienced it at one time. In my life, Andrew, there was a time when I was doing a certain program. And I think this I've ever shared before on this space. But, I, but again, it, it, comes into, it, it comes into this topic of emptiness. There was a time when I was doing a certain program. And then it reached a point where I was sitting in this space and I was the only black person there. The rest were, <laughs> the rest were white people, really. And, 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 and then it turned out that we are meant to be submitting pieces of work time and again. They review them and the supervisors give you feedback on them. Now, it reached a point where I realized that my pieces of work were repeatedly rejected. <laughs> and I was like, well, like, am I making any headway with this? You know, because every other, every other piece of work, they are like, no. And this was a research program. You know? and, 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 and I sat in this office. I think there were about six people in that space. I was, uh, the other five were, 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 were white people. And, and, and I sat in this space and I felt a sense of emptiness. <laughs> whereby I was like, well, is it because I'm different? So uh, under the layers... The experiences of emptiness may vary from one place to another, okay, and from time to time. Uh, and because I personally realize the, the level of emptiness when someone is probably in a foreign space is even much higher than when someone is at home. But again, Andrew, I will also conclude by saying that, you know, when emptiness comes, what is very important is for us to know how should I handle, you know, I mean, the important thing is that men, we should have break. We must find a, a tribe of colleagues, a tribe of fellow men where we can be able to, whom we can be able to hold forth so that we are able to move on. And, and I remember talking to uh, that, that colleague of mine who said, now they have, I have a sexual scandal at work. They have stopped me from work. I'm not earning my family is that a value of collapse now. When he shared that with me, I told him, well, we, we probably need to take it slow. We, we need to meet every day and talk through things. Things will be better along the way. But you find that he had resorted to drinking, you know, and, and, and I'm now looking at the downside. When you allow loneliness, when we allow emptiness to take a grip of us and then we relapse into even worse of situation, then that's when the problem might be. So I think the option might be the coping mechanism when we are feeling lonely and empty. And that's probably what we must always look into. And I think that will, sometimes people may find something else to keep them busy or actually to get the, get the brains more engaged, to minimize the likelihood 
disadvantage or negative impact which come along with the, with, with the psychological effects of emptiness. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I will be listening in, but I'm happy to answer any questions nonetheless. Thank you so much. Um, very grateful that you've given us different layers. And we look at it, um, cut off face to say, is you don't even know how it starts. You sleep but wake up tired. You wake up and can't feel great. You feel insecure and worthless. You have somewhat happy moments, but the feeling always comes back. You badly want to fill the heart with so much happiness, but pain chose me. That's his take on this. And there are different fields within that will actually tell us more of this conversation. Let's hear from uh, Peter Ahawe. Um, Kansto, talking about this conversation today, in your, in your line of work, how does loneliness or emptiness impact your motivation and productivity in your career? And where have you made it head on? And how did you deal with it? Peter? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, a great question. I, 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 I just, I, when I saw the topic, I, I had to drop in and share because um, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> uh, but I, I tend to listen more. I love listening. They keep saying that if you're in a meeting, uh, the person who speaks last, usually you hear that they have probably listened to everyone's views and um, they'll be able to, if they're very, very, very great listeners, they'll be able to articulate a solution. So I just come from that angle because I've had two of, of my colleagues, friends, uh, who I have shared with uh, their experiences. So I just want to first begin with uh, the nature of, of the work, you know, the structure of the workplace we work in. We work in a very capitalistic um, society. So I want to begin there where it's a chess, chess, chess after this, chess after that. And I share from that because it's a, if you've heard of the very simple phrase of how are things doing, uh, capitalism might to or, you know, uh, capitalism is winning. If you've heard of something like that from, from colleagues in a, you know, maybe corporate uh, kind of trade meal, something like that, that they're chessing. And in that, um, it, it sort of inadvertently, in a very subtle way, it breeds the topic that we're discussing today, where people want to leave office, uh, drive, and sit somewhere for even just an hour and just be by themselves. Or you find somebody is just seated at a cafe, restaurant, uh, roadside. They just want to be by themselves, you know. And I will speak to that because there's just that. The first two things, me, myself, I want to qualify them as uh, they've been used interchangeably when I tried doing some, uh, some time back about a year ago to when two of my colleagues, was, the stories I'll share with you, went through something like this and they're men. So me, myself, I would qualify it as solitude. So I, I just want us to get straight there. There's a bit of a difference there when you say me, myself, or I just want my, my, my me time. I could qualify that as solitude. And then there's a state of loneliness. And I think I would qualify that with a story of, sorry, Andrew, I, I refer to what Andrew was going through. Now, just to uh, be brief in my sharing, a friend of mine calls me at about, I think, um, it was about 11 p.m. and says, hey, hey are you you're around? I said, yeah, uh, this is sometime last year. And says, I just want to talk to somebody. And when I got in and before I even started sharing, um, they get broke down, like literally, yeah. And, and I'm like, hey, hey, uh, it's fine. Like, it's fine, just continue, do that. Like, allowed the guy to just break down. And then fellow young guy, we just left uni together. And he breaks down for almost close to an hour and then says, um, after that time, I said, I allowed him, I didn't, I didn't even stop him. And after that, he just said, I need acceptance. Been in part of this entity, I don't feel like I'm accepted here. I have done everything there is, uh, recognition, uh, to be identified, to feel included. Um, I, I just want to feel like I'm part of this place. And I remember, you know, when we just, uh, before everything, we went into now deep the part of the conversation. I told him, you, you don't want to be part. You don't want, to, you don't have to feel part. If you don't feel like you are recognized, you are included, then probably that's not your space. Yeah. And one of the things that I want you to focus is don't focus much more on being identified. Do your role and exit, you know. But that's not the advice that I want to give my fellow men here because I felt that that time what I was just telling him was it was temporary, but it wasn't solving a long time. And this is what speaks to some of the qualifiers. If you've had in a long time had an issue with your self-esteem, right? If in your longest time you have not identified your character or as a person, as a man, are you an introvert? Are you a man who, you know, likes, like uh, Andrew said, you like your private time and, and you, you're, you're not very extroverted. 
some of these things when they draw down because don't forget where we started capitalism because you don't know how to deal with the masses you don't know how to deal with the social structure you have issues with um clashes like the social cultural cl clashes that element will draw on you right it's a temporary solution but you need to go deeper and understand that that when you understand that you're an introvert then you know how to deal because it gives you a different angle of dealing with yourself so th that's the first place where I come in with, with this, uh, that loneliness because as, as, as men is, is that destructive because um, it erodes, it, it erodes your, your ability to, to relate, it erodes your ability because it isolates you, it erodes your ability to think, you know, it erodes your ability to react, uh, you know, directly to the emotions and with a rational mind because when you operate with an emotional mind as a man, then you're likely not to have a sense of judgment rationally to things because you quickly want to react. So I just want to I wanted to qualify that uh, with two things in terms of the solitude. Solitude is is actually healthy. Me myself, it's it's very I would qualify it as healthy because when you have your me time, in your me time, what I would uh, I usually say is in your me time is when you think better. You try and project. Uh, somebody talked about career, Ivan, my my colleague. Um, uh, it's when you think of you pro, you say you draw a trajectory in your solitude time because that's when you're spiritual. You say how am I how am I with my Lord as a man? Because men, you know, dimensional. You know, the Bible speaks, and I was sorry I refer to this for for those you forgive me who are not Christians. You are the principal. Uh, sort of preacher in your family. So when you can't pray as a man, then you have a struggle when you can't sit on your knees and say, how are you in your in your spiritual life? That's when solitude comes in that you need to focus on yourself. Your friends, you know, uh, as men, you know, we are supposed to have an element of, of brotherhood and a colleague hits you up and Faisal says, hey, like um, Andrew has told you that he called one of, you're supposed to reach out listen listen before anything by the way these people this whole dawning of loneliness takes a whole toll on you uh, somebody said they don't know when it starts actually when you do a, a very clear introspection you notice you started by today you just don't want to talk to anyone uh, then the next week they say there's a social gathering i don't want to come and then you're given an assignment it takes more than something you are taking two hours it takes five days um uh, then your social battery dies out yeah so those are some of the things and i'll just now <laughs> answer I've, I've, I've flipped through my time i did i did it take about five ten minutes uh, andrew now to your question i think lawyers uh, we sit at a space where we we are given people's problems to solve yes but we are we sometimes don't know how to heal ourselves yeah and that has done on, on so many who have resorted to as you've heard as, as in maybe the social structures drinking right uh, uh, going around sleeping around uh, we resort to that um some people become uh, maniacs of the work which is also deadly you start reading so much you get very infused in your work you know because of that um then loneliness has an element and i will speak to this even in our workspace of you you try and you get very grounded in a bubble right where which which is something that andrew spoke about that you want to tell everything everyone and everyone and everything that it's fine it's fine by me it's the day that hell breaks loose right you might not actually, it can take you almost a year to recover from that breakdown. Yeah. So it's very important that um, in those bits and moments when it dawns on you and say, today is a very heavy day. Uh, one of the biggest advice I'll just give is, please, if you're a prayerful person, do that. But sometimes speak to a person. Call a colleague. You don't need to, and don't be very, they tell us that men don't cry. Please break down. <laughs> I keep telling guys that it's very okay as a men to break down. So call a colleague, sit down with them two, three minutes, right? You might not share the entire story, but if you can share it in bits and you don't mind telling them every Saturday morning, I want to take a walk with you just to tell you about how this one year has taken a toll on me, do that. And if they're great listeners, just choose this one person who you don't think will judge you, condescend you, uh, or gaslight your, your feelings. They will be very, very kind to, 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 to help you. So Andrew, I think those are my views. I, I'm very keen on this uh, kind of a topic because I think a lonely man is an extremely dangerous man. I, 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 you, you forgive me to qualify my, and my submission like that because uh, you, you can actually take up the, one of the heaviest drastic mistakes in your life. That's when you can choose to, you, you even start contemplating ending your life. It's a very, very dark area. Yeah, if you ever find yourself in that kind of a place, please, please, uh, as a man, because like I've told you, and men we like saying, I, I got this, I got this. It's very okay to wake up in the morning if you don't feel like going and text a friend and say, hey man, I can't make it today. But please, if after work you can drop by my place, I just want to talk to you, right? And and do something that you think actually brings out life in you. Don't drink, don't don't start drinking because you're like, ah oh, man, I saw my body drink. No, it's not your lifestyle, don't try it. Don't do smoking, it's not your thing, you will die from that. Don't go around sleeping or oh, whatever because as men we are, you say, oh, there's this kagalo. Then you jump on a five minute weakness and it has a long time effect, yeah? So don't do that. Just dr drive yourself to an ability where you say, I am going through this, yes, and accept it.
and then ensure that you encourage yourself to look out for that long-term solution to enable you to be a better man for the long-term spanning time. So those are my views, Andrew. I hope I, I have tried to answer the you've, question. You've yeah. done tremendously great. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. It's always humbling to have divergent opinions and views because they give us a finer perspective of this. Someone just dropped a DM here and it says, Mankiv, I lost my wife seven months ago. Any man who has lost a wife is maybe in position to understand how I feel. Waking up in that bed and there is no one, it's weird. When everyone comes and um when anyone comes in and comforts you and it's all now gone people always think that you're now better after a month but brother it is deeper than the darkness i've ever met no one prepared me for this it is lonely it is lonely and i hung in here with only my daughter who is now two years but it's dark Money doesn't make sense to me, yet I make lots of it. Positions and titles have since looked useless, and it's empty. But in, in the gym, sorry, the message is quite long, uh, so I'm scrolling down to, to save time. But in the gym, I'm happy. I'm actually always crying, but people think it's straight in the gym. It's lonely. It's lonely. I am suffering on, on the side that I lost a dear one. But no man, no man should ever be in this space of loneliness. It's dark. I hope to get how, the how, in this space today. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I want to bring in Elder Hubbard here. And um, for Elder Hubbard, given that um, you're one of the key leaders, uh, I'm sure you are at a hacker while you're talking to us. And before you give your submission, I'm going to request that you give us uh, a clear picture of what the experience looks like at Ahaka. What should we expect when we come at Ahaka? Because I'm aware there are some men who are coming during the Easter season to Ahaka uh, to celebrate with you. But after you've told us that, my question to you, Herbert, would be, how has experiencing loneliness influenced your approach to leadership and decision-making in your business and the other positions you've held ever in life? And in what ways can loneliness be both a challenge and an opportunity for innovation and creativity in the business world? Herbert? Thank you. Good morning, Manikev team, whoever is here. It's a bright Saturday morning, and I do welcome everyone. Now, what a topic. Most of our topics have been very exciting, looking at how men can engage, uh, you know, do so many things in our lives. Now, this topic is like, yes, that moment when you feel like you are not going to do anything. And, Andrew, specifically for me, to come up with this concept of a hacker was honestly, to solve the problem of loneliness. I can tell you this. This concept came way back during the COVID time. I had just got a new job, and the lockdown started 2020 March, and I had to go back home. Every person went back home. But the home I went to, it was only me and my wife. But around the same time, the government was so lenient to us that those people who had business, hardware businesses, can stay open. But for me, I had to stay at home to do work, serious work, because I was a country leader, I was a project leader, and I had to make sure that I keep working. Health projects were allowed to continue working. So I wake up in the morning, sit at this window, at the balcony, look at the environment, and it was extremely quiet for me with only birds, and a few vehicles would pass in the background and it was deep lonely every day, Monday, Friday. Remember, you have been used to working with people in an office, so many guys, so many people coming in, greetings, do meetings, do all these things. You know, it's always busy. But this time around, you are lonely, and you have to do all these calls, they end, and what next? You have nowhere to go. You look forward, and you wait for your spouse to come, and by the time she comes in, you are like, oh my God, finally you are here. So, for me, it was an intervention that would allow people come here and this is the way it is designed yes i have the cottages but it is a space where you can speak to yourself where you can speak to nature where you can speak in a way that now if i can't talk let me use my body that's why i put the spa i put the gym i put swimming so that people can come here and if they want to speak to me i will be available if they can't speak to me then i will let them be but in the meantime 
they can start reflecting on their lives. And it has been a therapy, I can tell you, to many men. And they find me here. Some ask, can I speak to you? And I see them come alone. They say, can I speak to you? I say, yes. Then we start with how I came up with the concept. We have all these conversations. And, and by the time I notice it, the money is opening up. So many things. My recent guest was from Zimbabwe. And this guy, I can tell you, has been in several countries. He's here in Uganda. He's lonely. He spoke to his child. He spoke to his wife. He spoke to his relatives in my presence. But that wasn't enough. He still needed someone to enter his mind and speak to his issues. And we had a good time. And I let him go and rest. And the following day, you know, we again, you know, chatted um, around midday. He went back. Now, loneliness has hit me several times. I can give my own, a little bit of testimony. Then I would come back to your question. I had longed to go and study, do postgraduate studies. And my sponsorship came through and I was up to Netherlands. When I got there, I met many people from different countries. New culture, new country, new everything to me. I hadn't gone out to live in a country that was as beautiful as Netherlands. And I had studied about Netherlands in my geography, so it was an excitement to be there. But by the time I knew it, after one month, I couldn't speak to the people I was staying with. All my minds came back home, looked at the baby I had left in the house, looked at the job I had abandoned, looked at the relatives I could not speak to, looked at my business I could not check in. I had a bank loan. I had all several things around me. And I was like, these studies, 18 months I'm here, I don't know how I'm going to cope. Okay? So I decided to ask around and follow other people who were senior and doing this space already, uh, from the students who were, um, had been there for some time. And I asked, how can I get my mind around these things? Because for me to go on the computer, go in the class, I come back, I'm lonely. I go to my hostel. It was on the beach. And it was a beautiful beach. You know, it was ever busy during the weekends or even during late nights. But I wouldn't even go there and enjoy. I would just walk around the waters and I still feel lonely. One great evening, which was even, I think, that's when I woke up to say, what's wrong with me? I sat in the tram. And the kind of metros in the America, but the trams are the ones that these snaking, you know, trains in the middle of the cities. So I would take a tram from the university in the Hague, in the middle of Hague, then to the west, uh, which is at the beach. And you jump out and you go to your hostel. But this time, I did not disembark. So the thing turned and loaded the new passengers with me. We went back to the Hague. And I felt like I was sleeping, but I wasn't sleeping. Then again, it made another turn to go back to the beach. And until I think the workers on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the farm realized that, I mean, this guy has been here. He's not stepping out. What's wrong? So the one person approached me. Luckily enough, late in the evening, they don't charge people. So I said, you man, you have not gone out twice. So we are going to go the third time. What the hell is going on with you? Can you just back? Then I was like, oh, no, I thought I hadn't reached. No, the man said, we brought you here. We took you back. Now we have brought you. You need to get out. So I said, okay. You know, with the Dutch language, sometimes those words you don't hear and with your poor English. So I stepped out. When I got into my room, I realized I was extremely, very, very lonely. And because of the so many things that were going in my mind, I knew I was going to get into a worse situation. So I started seeking my friends until I got a Zambian who was a very hyper guy with a lot of music and all of that. And I said, can you always be opening for me when I come back in the evening so that I can have you, you know, uh, uh, get my mind awake? Then he said, if you are like this, and I've seen many of the people like you, I'm going to look for you a job, and you'll start working late in the night. And he found me a job to start working at midnight, and I would end my job at five in the morning. Now, what does this imply? That was not going to sleep at all. You know, after work at five a.m., you go to your hostel, you would dress up to go to the lecture or have breakfast, go to the lecture, and then in the evening, you are not going to sleep so easily because everyone else now waits for Kabozi, and I start preparing for my assignments. After that, then I start thinking about my job. It was horrible, you know? And there were no mobile phones that you can speak to. We would line up on the telephone booth in the hostel to speak to our people at home. And every time I stand there, most of the people were actually making noise and even quarreling or speaking nicely or lovely to the far end people back home. But in my case, sometimes I would go back twice without speaking. I said, now, what am I going to talk to my people, you know? So guys, here's the thing. Many people can be extremely um, isolated, emotionally isolated, and you are with them and you don't notice it. You need to pick out the signs. And the signs are so easy. The most things that take people very quickly is when they start abusing the things that would be obviously normal. For example, they can abuse sex. They would want to have sex every other minute. That person is having a problem. 
they can abuse drinks. They will start drinking and drinking and drinking non-stop. If you are with that kind of friend or guy around you, he's not normal. He needs help. They can abuse food. And they're like eating, 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 eating. And by the time you notice someone is like doubled his size. Please, you need to watch out. That person is not healthy. He needs emotional support immediately. They will do most of the things that would be normal excessively. And what, when that point reaches, and if you don't intervene very quickly, I can tell you, it will be gone. The person will be gone. And it will be very complicated for you to start providing the immediate help. It is even interesting, Andrew, that even within the families, some spouses don't easily pick this up. You know, you, you, you go to the house, you get out, you go in, you get out. The children might say, but that is no longer greeting us. Or the, the, the wife might say, ah, this is him. You know, sometimes when he gets back from work, that, that's how he behaves. So how do you help people who are having challenges at work with perhaps excessive work and they are burning out and there seems to be no sense of, 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 of from the leadership, no sense of understanding that people are actually going to the extremes, you know? And for me, because some of these things have happened to me, I'm very sensitive to the people that I work with, to the people that I live with, that the people that are around me. And I keep checking to see, is this person acting normal or is acting abnormal? And I try to trace the behavior patterns the little thing that someone keeps doing, you know? Because if you see some of the accidents, just be, people just have their mindsets way out of the door. And someone is driving, but he doesn't even know where he's driving to. Okay? So you need to watch out some of the things that people continuously do that are abnormal, but for them, they think it is okay. You know, if you don't help, you will find yourself crying because someone will be already too gone. I keep checking on my little ones, my son, my daughter. If they don't speak to me in a week, I'll say, this is not normal. What is happening? And sometimes young people think, uh, ah, we are bothering daddy, we are bothering mommy, we don't need to, you know, always check on them. Yeah, but you are checking on them, they're also checking on you. They are trying to see if you are actually okay. Okay, please use your airtime to solve problems, to prevent the worst happening. You know, make sure that yeah, you, 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 you are in a likelihood of... Um, of, of, of not being nagging someone or trying to over um, involve yourself in someone's life, but trying to make sure that you have a way in which you can check. The old people around have formed um, an association. There's some say we shall always call each other every evening at this time or every morning at this time. But if someone does not check in, then it means something is happening. And you go there and visit physically. You know, now there are these other proud guys who don't want to be uh, entertaining others or they don't feel like people should, you know, put their nose in their affairs and all that. Those are the characters that are likely to be victims. And this thing does not, uh, uh, does not uh, in a way save whether you are rich or you are a guy who thinks you, you have it all or you are, and even the celebs, you know, the celebs like Andrew, they suffer most and he, as he correctly stated at the beginning, you wouldn't even imagine it because he's social outgoing, he speaks to many people, they call him, wherever he is, there is a crowd around him and he can't end up being lonely among all the crowds that turn up and no one touches the inner issue that he's suffering. The last point I want to pick out and especially for men, yeah, some of you could be closer to my age, um, but some of you could be in your mid of 40s. This is the prostate issue that we are having. So majority of the men have been keeping quiet around here. And by the time they notice, their prostate cannot allow them to do their real function. And they don't want even to tell their women. They don't even want to ask someone else if they are going through the same thing. Now, because there is a lot of stigma, there is a lot of you know issues attached around that issue, um, so men suffer quite hard way. They really, really suffer. Guys, check on your father. Check on your uncle. Make sure that they are okay. Prostate health is killing men. Now, one prominent person has really gone through the process of surgery, and and he's just like 60, around there. He's still a young man. He's still okay for me when I see him as a young man. But where he went to do the prostate surgery, they did it badly, and he lost it. I mean, you can't have sex anymore. Now, this is the guy who has his family, he has his wife, he has his many things, his status is up there, but the man is lonely. He doesn't want to stay in his house because he's a lovely wife. What can he do? And this thing has gone on one year, two years, three years. So he recently opened to me and I said, and he said, but what do I do? I can't stay close to my family now. I need to be, I have to be alone. 
And I said, please, now that we are together, let's always have time to share about these things and have fun and all these things. And it's, I can see him now coming back socially, you know, engaging people, you know, talking and being a part of our social life. But it's not easy. And especially when he goes back to his house. So now he's like staying separate from his family. But the point here is, he keeps telling me, I don't want to be close to my love because I can't give the love she needs. You know, those are the hard stuff that majority of the people at my age are going through. And he keeps on regretting. I postponed this thing until it had to close. And the surgery was horrible. And this is what I'm going through. And I can't tell people that I can't even make a woman happy. So what is it in this life? And the guy is super rich. Super rich. So don't pretend that you are too busy. That certain signs have started coming through. And that you can't open up to someone. Okay? For me, I'm here at a hacker. If any man feels he wants to open up or he wants to be alone or he wants to be given things that can make him reflect on his life, it's open. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for this opportunity. And men, don't let... Even young ones suffer these kinds of things. I, had, I have had to deal with a guy on the phone all the time because he says, I'm going to lose it, I'm going to lose it. I'm go and to lose it meaning he was going into drugs. You know? Please don't go there. Don't go that direction. Even when you are disappointed by the person you love most or the person you trusted the most, or the things that you thought you had, and things have changed. There are so many frustrations in this life, economics, you know, so many things that are happening. Even political leaders, everybody is suffering emotionally, and they are withdrawing, and they will end up in terrible loneliness. And by the time anyone realizes that you are on the edge of death, it will be too late. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Indugo Hubbard. Guys, stop whatever emoji you can to appreciate Hubbard. He has given us a very rich context. And... um this has actually triggered a lot of people. I see the DM is coming through and the other tweets are coming. Caro says, mine was when I, I, I took some time to walk to the sea and all was in my mind was no one was looking up to me. I had taken three months without, with no one calling my phone. Only my family could call me on my salary day to ask for money. You don't know what that means. And um, Habit has hinted on something very deep. He said, loneliness is not a respecter of class or status. At whatever level where you are, it does not respect <laughs> that it will hit you so hard. And you don't need to hang in there to be extremely stronger, um, that, that, that you can handle this no matter the case. Please seek help. Be bold enough. And you talk to experts about this. Um, now that I have Stuart and uh, counseling psychologist Mwalimu here with us, I'm going to talk to Stuart here. From the psychological standpoint, um, so what, how do you differentiate between healthy solitude and harmful loneliness? Because Peter Ahawe alluded to solitude, mm -hmm. where you have your me time and you're in position to reflect and have introspective as an, as an, an individual. But how do you differentiate between healthy solitude and um, harmful loneliness there? Thank you, Andrew. And um, thanks for um, my seniors, um, like um, Hubbard, for sharing um, on the, this crucial topic. Um, I've had a bit of submissions that are really amazing. But I think we have nailed uh, the, literally the issue to the point. Um, solitude, um, if you just, I think you got a little bit of the description, um, you know, just instead of being alone. But I, I guess, personally, from a perspective um, of solitude, it's more you allow people or a change of situation, um, in, like people in your circle in a kind of way, but then when you go to the other part you mentioned um, about, you know, chronic loneliness or chronic solitude, it's where people decide to harm it. Um, and that hamiting is more around of, I guess, the psychological side of distress um, or looking for ways to um, navigate by seeking answers, but without answers. It's like more of a boundary locked into a room uh, without no ventilators. Um, I've been fortunate enough, um, I would say, to get access to data. And I think we have had this conversation back and forth when it comes to data collection. Um, being a behaviour person here um, and working in collaboratively with the Australian Child Welfare, um, Minister of Health and Welfare, is that you get access to data. Um, you know, when you, can, when you literally raise the point about loneliness um, and you look at the statistics currently where, you know, men are sitting at 46.1 and women are sitting at 45.3, um, but, you know, I, I was very curious when, um, to know about what's happening home in Uganda and the fact that we're sitting at nine, the 9.3% uh, prevalence um, in data when it comes to chronic loneliness. Um, from, I guess, Andrew, from my personal experience, um, uh, loneliness caught me, and I think um, Senior Hubbard has mentioned about it, and I think it comes back and forth when people talk about international travel and studying and stuff. It's an exciting time when you're like, all right, let me go and... Um, see what's out there, but also get an education that I'm seeking um, to better myself and or what we we'll definitely call green pastures. Um, but it hits you differently. Um, like Senior Hubbard, I'll definitely share your experience that 
at the age of 19, um, leaving my family behind and literally not knowing anyone in Australia, <laughs> and then being left at the airport for two hours and they forgot that I was even coming. Um, so, and, uh, you know, um, then going to the baggage people and saying, I'm, I'm supposed to go to this uni, but I have, I don't have a phone number and stuff. So to be picked up after two hours of flying all the way, um, you know, that was kind of my glimpse, like, oh, I'm, I'm, away, f- I'm, a- I'm away from home. Um, it hits you definitely differently. But I guess, um, personally, it hit me um, a couple months, ag- a couple years ago, more so, um, when I definitely knew that I was, it wasn't just solitude. Um, it was getting to chronic loneliness. Um, I was working way too much. Um, I still do work, but the other one was way beyond even control. Uh, it felt like I was trying to shut down my feelings of exactly how I was feeling. And I think someone hinted on it, the fact that, you know, you work a lot and, the last thing you want to do is your family to support you. But then when, you know, every time you make a phone call back home, um, the thing is like, you know, send me a hundred dollars. It's only, it's only a hundred dollars. You know, you can manage it. It's, it's, it's less money to you. But I think people don't realize that the sacrifices you make for that hundred dollars um, to make sure you have it in your wallet. Um, so it hits you definitely differently. And I think personally, when I recognize the signs, well, and things in your habit as mentioned, the signs were that uh, I had started going with, I guess, a group of people that um, um, you know, thought that gambling was more of an aspect um, to overcome um, the chronic loneliness. Um, and then I realized myself that um, I was, I would make money, but then I would end up into the casino um, because it felt like I was being entertained by these machines. Um, so I would literally sit down there, um, you know, it's, for starters, it would go with um, 50 bucks and then it keeps increasing, you know, because you're trying to spend more time in that place where you think it's more fun um, to be in because of the machine, because of the lights, the music in the background. Um, I ended up realizing that I was, um, you know, um, coming to spending over, you know, $1,500 every time I, I was going to the casino, $2,000, $3,000. Uh, you know, this is, of course, making the money wasn't coming easy, but the spending it was just going minutes and then you get excited by the small wins that they would give you. Um, I guess it, then it came back to a conversation of, you know, um, talking to someone. But, Irrespective of just sharing my personal experience, and then it goes back to, I guess, the work I do. Um, I currently, um, I'm among, uh, with the Australian Childhood um, Trauma Group, um, when you look at their data and the conversations I have with these young ones, it's, it's sad to find out that um, children themselves are feeling lonely. Um, that when you have a conversation about their behavior um, and say, you know, I would like to find out, and you do the QBF and the S-calls um, assessments, and the child is like... Um, like I think, I don't know who talked about it, but I think it was Senior Hubbard, uh, that um, um, the parents themselves um, are worn out. They are reporting fatigue. Um, you know, they're working a lot and stuff. So what we see is that children um, are resorting um, to harmful behaviors. Um, and I think, Andrew, you hinted this on yesterday at your um, conference you had with the children at uh, Bubaga Gals. I was, I was listening in. Um, the children are resorting to the internet. Um, first of all, of course, to be entertained because of the stories are there but also they are being put at risk, um, at very high risk when it comes to um, the exposure to, of course, pedophiles, um, um, you know, sexual, a lot of sexual content uh, being put out there, um, but also just their minds are not grown to that extent of, um, you know, coping up with the way and the data that is happening um, or the, whatever content is being put out there. So you look at a kid, um, I can give you an example of the young one I'm supporting, 14 year old, um, without sharing confidential information and stuff. Um, he um, he has been through the criminal system quite a lot of times um, because he killed someone. Uh, he, he engaged in two drugs and uh, stole a car um, and then ended up crashing the car, killing someone. Um, so, but when we have to support and write reports um, to seek funding for um, him to be supported thoroughly, and he mentions a lot of things. And I think, um, and I, I know kudos to everyone who is literally engage in domestic violence like, you know, Reverend Nathan, because he definitely takes a troll on people. Uh, this, child, this child shares the story um, of constant sexual abuse um, from uncles, and that's when he has um, decided to engage into the drugs. Um, and he mentions that the day he, he stole a car um, um, and then ended up killing someone, um, it was because the uncle had sent another message saying, I'll see you tonight, and um, it's going down. So there's... Um, you know, sharing those stories, of course, it gets to you as a person. And I think that's why uh, we are lucky in the field that we are in that we get over 600 hours of um, EAP, um, of course, as also therapists, to talk to someone about exactly, you know, about these stories that we hear that then we have to, um, you know, dig deep down to find solutions, um, how best to support these kids to start from the criminal system uh, or the justice system. But yeah, um, uh, I guess, Andrew, there's a lot of things to say about chronic loneliness, but I think personally, as a, from the perspective of, um, just to, you know, give a bit of hints that, um, you know, as men, 
we need to start talking and having a conversation. I think it was Peter who mentioned about where we, they say men don't cry, um, or you cry, you crack. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I love the saying where it says that um, I, I'd rather give you my shoulder to cry on rather than carry your coffin, um, you know, six feet under the ground. Um, you know, it's you always, I guess, that we have this uh, social, you know, stigma around that uh, we are men and uh, we don't have to talk. Um, men are dying. Um, and that's why I think we need to, start having things like, are you okay day? I love, are you okay day here? Because we have, we ask the conversation and we've had conversations where, you know, are you okay has to be literally every day. Uh, but we have this generic time where you ask someone, are you okay? And the first thing they say is, yes, I'm okay. But then when you ask again, are you okay? Are you usually literally, are you okay? Someone breaks down and cries um, and says, actually, I'm not okay. Um, so I think as men, we need to indulge yourself with the, you know, social groups that, uh, first of all, align with our principles, but more so also, to be able to open up, um, open up to the right people, of course, that people are not going to make fun of it because also opening up is crucial, but who exactly are you open to um, is very critical. Um, but also looking for um, that keep self person. Um, suicide is real. I've been, a, I've had the idea for myself and I've shared my story with Lottery International, which has been published in the, the Lottery magazine. Um, but also the initiative that we have taken that are currently is being, um, I'll, be, I'll be receiving a certificate by, from the Ministry of Health uh, in May uh, for the initiative on mental health and suicide in low to middle income countries that we are trying to, the work we're trying to uh, get across. Um, but I think it's the conversations needs to start with us. And I think I love, I really love this topic, Andrew, that um, I always try to listen in and hear what people say, but definitely um, chronic loneliness, I've been a victim of it. Um, and I think uh, a man to man, um, let's have the conversation, let's, um, let's talk. I'd rather have you, I'd rather give you my shoulder um, to cry on and have a conversation to see how best we can support. And thank you, um, Senior Hubbard, for you know, um, putting it out there that uh, you're happy to have a conversation, paid or not. Uh, you're, you're literally calling men to sit down with you and have a conversation. I personally would, you know, um, would love that. And I, I hope I look forward to, to seeing you in a couple of months um, because I think it's definitely crucial. I would definitely love to have a coffee to hear more from an elder like yourself. Um, but um, you know, let's not um, let's support men to grow, but also to open up rather than um, you know uh, us or is sending in uh, money um, during burial ceremonies and saying that uh, we will miss you or rest in peace. Men are dying, um, and I think, like I've already said, um, time to act is now. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Stuart. And um, it's the twenty-one minutes past uh, eight in the morning. Many people are sharing on the platform. Um, Juju Gandon says all these are mind-centered. It always self-interest ideology fasten our human nature. However, loneliness is the thing we burden ourselves with and forget you better yourself than no other person. Don't seek self-justification from other sources, but rather yourself first. Mwalimu, Mwalimu, uh, oh, he dropped off. Mwalimu, I've sent you the invite again to speak. We have some psychological questions to ask here. Let's talk to Reverend Nathan. Reverend Nathan, well done for the work you're doing at um, Pe, uh, Mwedewe. And that is at Mwelewe. And as Man Kevuji, um, we pledge 50 bags of cement to this agenda. And I'm personally going to deliver this. And um, while we're still having that conversation, um, Reverend, <clears throat> let's talk about the spiritual context of this from the religious perspective. See, oftentimes when we're faced with this as people, we tend to say, <clears throat> we tend to say that we are going to pray about the loneliness from the spiritual context. So we try to diagnose mental issues with spiritual diagnostics. But what does the, the Holy Book say about this? Over to you. Uh, well, Andrew, thank you. Thank you, the previous speakers. Uh, the discussion is really intriguing in nature. Now, Andrew, I'm very glad that uh, we are bringing in the spiritual context. Now, this is my experience. The most lonely people that I have personally met as a priest, as a, as a career person, the most lonely people are the most spiritual people. So being spiritual does not make somebody uh, immune to loneliness. Because uh, the, one of the most dangerous issues with spirituality is people tend to pray and believe on fellowship. But at the end of the day, that doesn't mean that one is actually not lonely. Remember, like we have uh, heard before here, loneliness does not mean being alone. Some people are alone. But they are not lonely at all. Others have so many people around them. They are praying. They have fellowships. They are, they are converging in worship centers. But yet they are lonely. So loneliness comes irrespective of whether someone is alone or not alone. So that's a, that's a clear thing. And by the way, loneliness has been uh, worsened by the fact that uh, majority of the people are just praying. So we ask a question now. As people interact, are they interacting or it is just 
uh, plastic. And in religious settings, religious settings are, are danger zones for loneliness because we expect that people in religious settings we expect a given behavior. So somebody will somebody will behave in a certain expected way, even when they are dying from the inside. Then most of the spiritual arenas are very judgmental in nature. A lot of stigma attached to loneliness, to mental health uh, issues, to psychological breakdowns, to psychological disorders. So at the end of the day, you find that uh, majority of, of, of the people that are in spiritual spaces all the time are actually the most, the most lonely. They are not alone, but yet they are lonely. And loneliness is being in a, in a desert, even in a very big crowd. These are, these are three examples. Due to loneliness, we have quite a number of people engaging into what we call toxic spirituality. And uh, I believe uh, Elder Herbert, we have discussed this before in, on one forum. Toxic spirituality, where somebody spiritualizes everything, spiritualization of uh, medical issues, spiritualization of uh, psychological issues, spiritualization of financial issues, and it's running away from one's responsibility in the aspect of spiritualization. Now, that is a sign of loneliness. The other issue is, uh, in the spiritual arena, being in spiritual, being in spiritual spaces like uh, churches, mosques, shrines, being there and not even going for work. I mean, we are seeing people people staying in our churches all through Monday to Monday, Wednesday to Wednesday, morning to evening. Now, that is toxic spirituality, and it's one of the issues that we are fighting of late in our bid to achieve general wellness for everybody. So, that one is there. And then the other issue is uh, uh, spiritual emptiness. Spiritual emptiness, remember, spiritual emptiness does not come when you are alone. Okay, it may be when you are alone, but when, when I discuss loneliness, I want to discuss somebody being in a, in a crowd, but yet very alone. Somebody being in a crowd, but yet very detached. But also loneliness, in, in most cases, comes as a result of the failure to find an equilibrium, to find an, a, a balance among three things. That is the body, the mind, and the soul. So, says that uh, loneliness comes when people are alone. Not at all. Actually, Bagohaba talks about uh, 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 general figures, public figures, pu public figures. Now, public figures are the most lonely because at the end of the day, what cures lonely is somebody speaking to your soul, somebody speaking to your mind, and somebody connecting emotionally. And in most cases, public figures don't get this opportunity. Just like, by the way, just like us, the spiritual leaders, we don't get that opportunity because I mean, we, we are the cream of society, so our standard is just above. I mean, so at the end of the day, loneliness does not only come when past people are alone. In fact, people that are ever in crowds, having crowds around them and everything, these are the most lonely people. So, in the spiritual arena, <coughs> churches, you know, when I do the spiritual churches, mosques, synagogues, ecclesias, even shrines, loneliness is just too much. Because when, 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 the, when there is a lot of loneliness, then there is a lot of lip service. There is a lot of hypocrisy. There is a lot of uh, assumptions. Yes, uh, Stuart just mentioned it. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. You ask the second second time, are you okay? Somebody breaks down. Now, in most of the spiritual arenas and spiritual spaces, there is no such time. Oh, you know, praise the Lord. Yes, God is good. Or that God has been good to us. Yes, God has been good to us. But I mean, are, are we finding time to find to, 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 to explore? Are we finding time to explore the emotions behind Praise God. God is good all the time. You know, those things. Then the other issue is, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Yes. Peace be upon you. It is, it, is, uh, it is something that we are saying. Yes, it is a greeting that we are making. But the question is, is it really Salam or it is Hafok? You get that? So, Andrew, one, one of the campaigns that we are engaged in of late is making sure that spiritual spaces, spiritual spaces, religious spaces, are actually safe havens for people to have general wellness, but also to treat the, the, the phenomena of loneliness. I believe that when people try everything else, people will try uh, betting, people will try alcohol, people will try those th these so many negative and harmful coping mechanisms. The lasting space they run to is the spiritual space. The spiritual space. Therefore, we are currently running a campaign with the spiritual and, and religious leaders such that they can attend to these needs, psychological needs, emotional needs. Otherwise, you can find a, a full church when everybody is lonely, including the pastor in his home. Because uh, maybe society tends to think that the pastor is immune to loneliness, to, to emotional challenges, to emotional breakdowns. And Papa Abad shall attest to this. In most cases, we have found the most devastating cases of suicide among the religious. And the cases that we, we, have, uh, we have assessed, these are among the people that are religious. Suicide, alcohol, breakdown, uh, loneliness, solitiveness, suicide ideations, all of these are in the spiritual realm. So, Andrew, it's not business as usual. We are in a crisis of loneliness. But loneliness attacks even when somebody is in a very good crowd. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Reverend Nathan Mogalu, 
for being a part of this. Um, okay, uh, please, when you when you confirm that you're going to speak, mute your speaker or your microphone so that we can um, be listening to one another. It's coming to 8.30 a.m. And we've been joined by uh, my dear brother, um, who happens to be um, Robert Burare from Kenya. We have had conversations with him again and again, and uh, we are yet to do something big. He, <laughs> he has kept telling me, Andrew, you need to <laughs> you need to do something bigger for Ugandan men, and we're going to have that conversation. And I went on over this conversation to my co-host this morning, but allow me to to trigger the counseling psychologist with us, uh, Mwalimu here. Mwalimu, can chronic loneliness be seen as a precursor to mental health issues such as depression and anxiety in the context that... Um, that sometimes it's just normal. There is a man here who has just shared, and this is so painful, very, very painful. He said that my loneliness started when my ex-wife just woke up one day, requested for divorce, and she left me because I'd got a super rich man. And that time my job contract had just expired. I need help. I have nowhere to start from. So he's in that state. How do you balance that, Malim? Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, you are. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Man KFUG, and uh, uh, those who have spoken first, uh, we really glean a lot of wisdom from you, uh, Abad, Reverend Nathan, and, and all other members of the team who have shared, Stuart, uh, for the great work you're doing from that other side of the world. And we appreciate because the statistics and uh, the work, like we mentioned, looking at the stats for Uganda definitely comes to help. But the center, Tahaka, beyond what happens there, you've opened your life to say, if there be men here who come spend some time but also troubled and personally want to speak to someone i'm here i'll, I'll give a party on the shoulder i'll give you a manly hug and uh we'll sit over coffee and talk and uh you'll take your rest but also we can have a conversation and rebuild uh the broken uh places in one side and i appreciate Ndugu robert Brady, karibu sana. thank you so much so um andrew i will say that what you've said really makes a lot of sense and uh it is most likely to happen I've had uh, when you asked Stuart about solitude and loneliness, the, the the clarity put between the different about the difference between the two. Solitude, I think, it comes back to the motive. The goal of solitude is different from the loneliness. If if even loneliness has has a goal, you know, solitude is uh, an, an authentic, well thought about, uh, and informed decision. I believe by an individual with uh, their reasoning. To improve their productivity maybe in what they're trying to do or working on and and something like that while loneliness uh is, is such a desert is it is something we do not plan it is something we find ourselves in therefore the goals are not clear and the goals not being clear means that anything can happen in that space because we're not thinking right first of all because of the reasons that have led us there it is loss of a loved one it is uh, uh, uh someone mentioned that it's lonelier at higher rankings in job, you're a CEO, you're a big manager, you're an MD somewhere, you're a SLE. It's lonelier in that space. Everybody looks up to you. You're a husband, you're a father, you are a pair, you, you know, you have these responsibilities. So it's lonelier. All eyes are on you. And where are your eyes? Even your own eyes are on yourself. So it, it's wrecking. It's it's uh it's a you find you play yourself in a place of helplessness, in a place of uh feeling everything's coming down on you with nobody listening or nobody you can turn to. To find help and that can be such a desert that can be difficult to navigate and uh th th that's why we're here and i really so much appreciate uh this space uh talking me myself and and loneliness and how to embrace and i was thinking about the topic and embracing uh this emptiness i think we are talking positively looking at how we can work through it not it swallowing us because it's a big fish it's an elephant R rather yeah it's not that we're not swallowed but then embracing means positively and qualitatively and uh, the, the right adaptive ways of, of, of working around this, navigating life uh, when we find this happening. Andrew, towards your question, I agree that this is a big mental health problem because it begins like this. The pressures that we have, maybe let me use an example of uh, a workspace. Maybe you're the MD or the, your, uh, the CEO of that company or your celebrity or even as a, as a, as a husband uh, who's lost uh, their loved one or any other problem that may happen or the pressures of life. What happens is that in that moment, you are looked at like, like, like uh, our friend uh, Robert Burale normally says that, that men are celebrated when they are 
they're making all the achievements and everything and and and, and when we break down and he says like lions even lions get wounded and when we break down there's nobody around to so in that moment is when it becomes a mental health problem because at that moment you have not been able to find someone to help you and you're struggling with this alone so you start getting uh the stress levels get chronic you know there's a certain amount of stress that is necessary for us to be able to keep on top of our games if you're working on a project there's a period of time so you stress everything of yourself to hit that target your muscles contract your breathing rate may change you may increase and but all this is a necessary challenge for you to keep on top of your game but the problem is when this stress gets chronical it spills over into anxieties when you cringe everything that comes is coming ahead you're not sure of your own self or what you're going to give and then comes in depression you start feeling less of yourself you start getting sad moods about what's going to happen and and it may end up into even panic attacks maybe and then there it has become a problem but because we are men our training our culture and traditional training save for when now we have people like robert brady and richard Magello, papa but and team here at men man cave and other spaces it's always up to us to figure out and someone will say you're a man so you should figure out and and some people in families even their wives will not understand and first of all the fear is to speak about it to someone also there's a sense in which someone feels they would be thought about as low and, and weak and not able to man up and i always tell men that actually speaking confidently about something that one is struggling with is not a sign of weakness but rather it's strength that someone is grown a certain level of self-awareness that they know their strength and weaknesses and then when they feel there's a need where they need to speak to a fellow man to speak to a trusted person to go seek professional help about what they're going through then i call that real man real men speak about their problems real men acknowledge where they have weaknesses they don't work around to, these insecurities they have to, to protect their weak area that's the wrong way the right way is to speak about it and find the kind of help that one needs so andrew i hope i'm getting to your question or i've been able to put insights to what you're asking but that's how i can respond and i really appreciate uh, this opportunity and thank you man Kev. thank you over to you andrew. thank you so much mwali mohangin there we're going to actually tap into you and the men we have what we call safe spaces uganda where it's a mental health space it's in chambago and they have other places around the country where Mwalimo sits and others. So if you're a man and you're going through some turbulence, when you go to them and you tell them I'm from Man Cave, you'll have a discount and all the services that will be rendered. I want to hand over this conversation and the mic to um, my young brother, Engineer Faisal, there to take over the conversation. Over to you, Faisal. Right. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much, Chamagero. And uh, thank you to the previous speakers. It's really been a knowledge throughout the entire morning. Uh, if you, in case you're just joining the space, we are talking about men and loneliness, emptiness, embracing that emptiness within. Um, Mwalimo, before you go, um, I just have a small question. Someone has shared a question via my DM. So the question is, uh, what are some practical ways you can make time for a better for a better mental health i think he meant for for yourself to recover so i, I don't know if you can just respond to that before we go to uh, robert Burali. okay um well so there are many ways and these are a basic uh, like really uh that, that that are basic ways of, of keeping a good um, mental health because it is important because when our mental health is, is, is in the right place when we don't have uh, mental illnesses or disorders taking toll down on us that is when we can be able to connect well with family and work that is when we can be able to produ to be productive effectively that is when we can be able to exploit all our potentials that is when we are thinking right we are being contributive in the right and positive way and qualitative way to the people around us to the work to to, to the family as a parent or as a husband or as a father so that is uh it's necessary so there are very many ways because we can mention things like um someone not turning to drugs or substances when they are feeling down or low or they're feeling stressed thinking of productive ways like talking to someone you know or seeking professional help we talk about things like you know sometimes finding rest pulling away from usual activities and the pressures of work whether you're a ceo whether you're someone a line manager whether you are a, a normal employee at, at a certain level finding some time to rest practicing relaxation and being intentional about it staying connected with uh, support systems like family, like uh, a men's group like this, you know, and uh, yeah, so something like that. Someone's faith is important. I'll not forget to say that. That also some of the reasons people suffer mental health actually is part of some reasons are spiritual related because we know, like uh, Reverend Nathan mentioned, there's a lot of loneliness in uh, people who are in spiritual spaces. My question, like, is to any counselor also we shouldn't be forgotten that also we need to we can suffer loneliness. So who counsels the counselor? Who helps the counselor when they're feeling lonely? Oh, shepherds the shepherd besides uh you know our our, our chief shepherd god 
we are created as social beings the moment anyone tries to run their race alone however good they are, they are or well achieving it's likely to come down crumbling everyone needs a uh, someone to speak to to do life with to be encouraged to trust and uh, feel a sense of safety and work through things um those are some of the ways you know we could go on and on take time to recharge i've mentioned that land by find some time to relax uh work-life balance you know some of us actually use work become workaholics because it, it is escapism it is a behavior we are using to run off from the real things we are working we are struggling with and some of us here may be victims of that so that workaholism is actually they're getting high on work it's become like a drug you know instead of dealing with the real problem some of us get carried away into watching movies and, and and spending a lot of time technology we need a proper balance of use of that technology the internet and things we do you know then i mentioned avoiding uh alcohol excessive drinking and irresponsible drinking and drugs if anyone is struggling with anything eating healthy that's so important a man i would love to tell us that we really need to be intentional about things like exercising regularly if you don't do you need to start and think of a routine of a practice that will help you to keep up with your body shape which informs how we feel and think about us which informs our esteem and our image i mean how much more even when you have uh, such a wonderful group of men as a support system beyond even just how we look how our shape how, how that supports our confidence so there are very many ways that we can use and uh, being able to track your stressors we should be able to know when things are not going well what things normally stress us what is our problem is it anger is it uh, where do we get agitated uh, where do we find uh, loss of patience in our day-to-day -day, uh, things and when we are able to track our stressors then we can be able when we know the problem then we can work on how to address the problem getting enough sleep some of us don't sleep we do work eight to five and then we have side hustles so it is in and out we and it is good to do that uh some of us men it's good to run up and down and gather the bread but be there when the bread is being consumed like plo said a family dinner meeting and praying together uh, spending time relaxing and having fun with the family and even if someone is not in a family context as ourselves taking care of ourselves you know all those are important and uh fruiting eating fruits and then water really and and plenty of fruits and it can go on and on and on so i hope that's been helpful but i'll still emphasize seeking professional health therapy when you need to and staying positive we need to be positive we need to be hopeful we need to be looking forward having a sense of meaning of life that is strong that gives us a reason to wake up tomorrow to impact lives to bring glory to god with our lives and what we do with the skills and training and every responsibility we have on to those who are immediate to us but also the community and world at large to make it better for ourselves and others Thank you, Afaizo. Over to you. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, definitely, definitely helpful. I think I'll highlight uh, having enough sleep and uh, working out as some of the coping mechanisms I've actually used in the past to get over my episodes of loneliness. I'd love to shift to uh, Robert, Robert Burale. Uh, Robert, if you could just give us your experience with today's topic. We're talking about loneliness. We're talking about embracing and coping with emptiness. So we would love to know from your experience, how have you gone through this as a man? Over to you, Robert. Mr. President, are you there? Okay. All right. As as uh, as we do wait, Robert, we can't uh, currently hear you. I don't know whether it's a problem with the the connection, the network. Okay, we see him raising the hand. Yeah, the, the floor is yours. If you could just unmute your mic and uh, try to speak. I think I think there's a network issue. So you could just try uh, dropping off from the space and joining uh, back again. It kind of sometimes seems to work. It's definitely a network issue. All right. As we do wait on uh, Dr. On, uh, Robert Burale, I'm seeing uh, Dr. Hochen. Dr. Hochen, can you hear me? I just want to confirm uh, first whether your network is fine. Hochen? Dr. Hochen? I see him here trying to reconnect. I think it's a network issue where, where they are. Yeah. All right. Uh, Robert, can you can you hear us now? Robert? Hi. Can you hear me, gentlemen? Yes. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear now. Yes, sir. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. It's just, again, an honor to be here with you, my brothers. And I really do look forward to coming again to Uganda, and we just have a tete-a-tete. -tete. Uh, the conversations are quite amazing, and and uh, it's just illuminating my mind to so many things. But allow me just to say something. Uh, I love saying this statement, it's a privilege to be a man, but it's difficult to be a man. Now, I'm here admitted at the Nairobi Hospital since last week, Monday. And and 
something amazing has happened in this one week, one and a half weeks that I've been here. People have been calling me, some people, and others have been coming to see me. But what shocked me is, oh, Mr. Brawley, we are sorry that you are unwell. Uh, God bless you and God heal you. But do you have a little bit of money you send to me? Can you help me with this? That said, my goodness, if it was a lady, and I'm not downplaying women, if it was a lady admitted in the hospital, it doesn't matter how much she helps people, how much, how many people depend on her, they would just bring flowers. But a man, even in his, uh, in his lowest moments, still must spot out some people, you know? It's those ones of get well soon and then, okay, now send me this money. Or what do you think I should do here? Uh, when are you getting out? Because something must be done. And, uh, and I sat one evening here in my hotel, my hotel, my uh, hospital bed, and I said, my goodness, for a man is only important when he can do things for other people. And I did feel lonely for some time. I did feel lonely. I did feel alone. I felt unappreciated in as far as my well-being is concerned. And I knew I was appreciated in my area of provision and solution providing for other people. And quickly, I started getting angry. And I know many of us here may get angry. Coping mechanism, angry. Some will go to alcohol. I've never drunk alcohol in my life. But then I sat on my bed and I prayed and the Lord told me, you got to understand I am the one that sticks closer to you. So how did I deal with that anger? Because it really brought a lot of issues in my mind. And I just played worship. I played worship and I started talking to God. And gentlemen, I'm telling you, and I'm not here to bust anybody's bubble. The world really cares about us largely in our time of provision, in our area of power. A weak man is like an injured lion that the fellow lions will want to drive that lion away from the area of authority. But what am I telling you, man? Love your area. If you're a spiritual man, those who go to religion, to, uh, to God, stick with God. He sticks closer than a brother. But as fellow men, we must stand with a fellow man. My scar must be the one to give you company while your wound is still painful before it becomes the scar stage. I want to urge you men in Uganda, please, be men who will behave like American soldiers. Understanding how lonely we get. And men get lonely even in a crowd of a million people. So don't think being lonely, being alone is when there's nobody around you. Some people are most lonely in a crowd. So as men, let my scar pick the language of another man's wound. And let my scar tell that man with a wound, I have been there, just hold on one more day. You will, your wound will come to a scar and the scar will turn into a star that will shine bright enough for other men who are wounded to see the way. Just like the star led the wise men to Jesus. May every man's star, which was once a wound, became a scar and now a star. Never use your star to make another man feel empty. Use your star to shine up the road and the path so that the man with the wound can hold on one more day where the sun will shine brightly on the wound and heal the wound into a scar. And then he'll find soldiers in that cave of Adullam that have other stars and when they come out, there will be mighty men with stars. And that is why. We are leaving no man behind. Me from Kenya, I should be able to talk to a man in Uganda and tell my brother, it is well. Then another man from Uganda tells another man in Sierra Leone, it is well. And I want to finish with this because I don't take your time and in case my doctor walks in, I'll have to hang up too quickly. I want to tell you something. Men, hear me and hear me good. Don't die of stress because if you die, another man will marry your wife and you'll be forgotten like nobody. You never existed. When you die before your time, many will come Within seven minutes of your body being interred, we now start discussing between Manchester and Arsenal, which is a better team. Where is the game? Where is the nearest bar for us to watch this game? We have buried the man. He has brought up so quickly in the faces of human beings when a man is buried. When a woman is buried, tears don't dry up. And that is why I'm telling you, men, be an encouragement to another man. Tell another man, okay, I know there's a weakness you're struggling with, but I understand, but let, listen to me. We are not going to allow you to die. Of all of us here, if one man dies, if one man goes into depression, it doesn't matter how much you, you have or how rich and powerful you, have, you are, we have all failed. I am a man on a crazy mission to make sure that the men all over the world must stand firm. When we die, it's because our time had come, not before our time. And gentlemen, just to encourage you, maybe some of you are saying, but you know, you look at Andrew, he's a public figure, he's meeting, he's doing all these big functions. You look at me now, I've advised a few presidents. Well, but before I got there, I was a sex addict for 15 years. Before I got there, I was addicted to strip clubs for seven years. Before I got there, gentlemen, I went into debt of about eight to 10 million shillings, Kenyan shillings, because of strip club addiction. Before I got there, I lost a marriage after one year, two days. Before I got there, I tried committing suicide three times. Before I got there, a cried tear saying, I have no hope. There's no light at the end of the tunnel until I got the revelation that there's not supposed to be any light at the end of the tunnel. 
I am supposed to be the light that will light up the tunnel. Gentlemen, I hope with this gathering we've had today, a man who came broken has been fixed. A man who came feeling that there is no light. The light within him has been flickered and it's now shining bright. And I want to finish with this story. A man fell in a ditch. And the ditch was so deep and he had somebody passing and he shouted, help me, help me. And the man looked down. He saw the ditch is so deep and he took a pen and a paper and wrote a note. And he says, when you get out, come, I am a doctor, I will treat you for free. How many times have we had when you get out? Not when I help you, when you get out. And the man walked on. And then after some time, a second man was passing and he, he shouted, help me, help me. I know, I know there are many men shouting, help me right now. And the man took a pen and a paper and wrote a note and he says, I'm a lawyer. When you get out, come, I will sue the company that dug this hole and did not cover it. And the man walked on. And this third time, where most men are, ah, he felt now there's no hope for me. And he only prayed to God that God, when I die, may my family find my body and give me a respectable send off. And his lips were getting dry. His uh, eyes were getting sunken and he knew he had no hope and his voice had gone. By a stroke of luck, he had somebody passing and he surmounted all the strength that he had. And he said, I will shout one more time. And he says, help me. And the man looks down and this guy looks up. He can't shout again. And he was shouting really with his eyes and the voice was not coming out because the strength had gone long. And this other man jumped into the hole. And this guy whispered to him, how foolish can you be? We are now stuck, the two of us. This guy looked at him and says, don't worry. I have been in this hole before. And know the way out. Gentlemen, every hole you have been is to help another man find the way out. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you, Ndugura Badburare. And um, before you leave, let me request the team, any one of us, please tap whatever emoji you can to appreciate a brother. Even in his situation of uh, health, he has taken time to actually talk to us. Uh, Your Excellency, Robert Burari, we want to appreciate you for the time. And um, we don't want the doctor to, to get you. Hold on there. But again, let me take this chance again to pass on a request that you have a conversation with the men in one of these spaces. We shall organize a reach out. And you talk about addiction to sex and how yes. much it actually damages the soul into trying to get with the physical realm of men. Absolutely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Right. Uh, what it does, uh, let me just touch a little bit on it. Uh, addiction, it's uh, sex addiction is what I call it, I'm doing a book on it, called the sweetest poison. It is a sweet poison that takes away the identity of a man. It is what takes everything within you. And I'll go into scripture. The Bible in the book of Proverbs chapter number five says, uh, the feet of a strange woman are anchored in hell. Stay away from this woman. Her lips drip of honey and her words are smoother than oil. When I struggled with this addiction, when you are doing it, you feel powerful. And the moment you're done, the emptiness that comes upon you cannot be equated. You feel as empty as the Arsenal Trophy cabinet. There is nothing there. I'm sorry, I talked on Arsenal. So what you got to understand this thing does, when I would walk around in town and anybody looks at me and says hello, I would think, okay, so they know what I have been doing. But what does that do? It took away my self-confidence. It made me feel useless. It hid the power that was within me. By God's grace, I'm extremely educated. By God's grace, I have some gifts and talents. But I felt that I don't deserve it. After all, what am I doing? I would sleep with anything in a skirt. So I don't deserve. And anytime a good door opened that I believe my academic qualifications or my gift deserved, I would walk away from that door because I felt I don't deserve that door. And then what it does as well spiritually, it puts a veil on your face. It makes the glory of God disappear. You look pale. You look down. You even look a bit different because the glory, the cupboard of God. So cupboard happens where the glory of God departs. When somebody compliments you, you get angry. And the only compliment you want is when you feel you have subdued a woman in having sex with her because that makes you feel powerful. But if you are going to give a woman $100 to have sex with her, she will tell you what you want to hear. So then I would go to these women all the time. And let me tell you, and you're my brothers. I would never want a position when you're having sex that makes the woman feel powerful. I would not allow a woman on top of me. I had to see her below me. It was the only sense of power that I had at that time. And gentlemen, I had my academic qualifications, I had my gifts, I had all these talents. But I only felt important when a woman was below me, looking upon me, telling me how good I am. And maybe at that time I'm not good. I'm like Andre Onana. But because I'm paying some money, I'll be told I'm like Peter Schmeichel. You understand what I'm saying, gentlemen? So I, I don't know, Mr. Andrew, if you can, one of these days, thank God I'm being discharged today or tomorrow. One of these days, let's organize. If I have to come to Uganda, I want to commit today. I will pay my own flight and come to Uganda. And let me do a talk, if you guys allow me, to do a talk on this thing. And then how to break the veil and how to take back your power. It took me 15 years to get my power back. I say today, if I did not lose those 15 years, 
by now I would have been the president of Kenya. I still believe one day I will, but those 15 years were taken away from me. So none of you should wait for 15 years. With information, five days is enough for you to take back your power. Thank you very much. Hassan Tendugu, um, we are going to organize that. Guys, we have a free ticket there to make this happen in Uganda. And those who know what it is, the time is now. Robert, I'm going to reach out and we'll have a phone conversation directly. But okay. my team and I are going to organize about this and we're going to, because families are breaking. Men are going through this, but they just don't know how best to engage it, especially when it gets to um, the sexual proneness, the brokenness on the inside that is reflecting on the outside. Big executives, line managers, um, just men at the campus, just starting out life. It's really hitting us hard. So this is a conversation we're going to have, and we'll be very grateful and glad to host you here. And while you're here, I will make sure that you actually visit Ahaka as well, that you get to see the beauty uh, side of the west of the country. Get well soon, Dugu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, all of you, and you gentlemen. Stand strong. We are leaving no man behind. Asante. Over to you, Faisal. All right. Thank you again, uh, Robert. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Uh, guys, you've had, you have a free ticket, so now we need a venue. If you are a man on the space and you feel like you need to contribute to this cause, we need to stand together. Just uh, You can DM Chamagero, either me or the Man Cave UG account if you do have a venue that we could, you know, use. We could just have this as, as soon as two weeks' time, you know, and uh, have Robert here with us. Thank you again. That was really, really uh, enlightening. I'll move on uh, to the next speaker, and this is... Uh, Boy child, boy child, can you hear me? Is your network okay? Yes, hi. Good morning to everyone. Am I around and clear? Yes, yes. You, you, you are loud and clear. So uh, if you could just tell us your experience with today's topic. We're talking about loneliness. We're talking about embracing emptiness as a man. How have you done it? How have you overcome emptiness? How have you battled those episodes of loneliness in the past? All right. Thank you, the moderator, for today. Thank you, the former speakers. And thank you everyone for attending. My name is Sime Corinis. I'm known as Tusime, a to, to Sime. To Sime, are you are, are you on the road? To Sime, are you on the road? Are you driving? Are you in transit? To Sime, are you in transit? Okay, I guess he's in transit. Yeah, I think the network is on and off. And um, Simon Oliver, can you hear me? Yes, hello. All right, Simon, uh, over to you. Uh, exactly what, what, what I was trying to <laughs> get from our former speaker, our previous speaker. Simon? Uh, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Engineer Faisal. Thank you so much, Mr. Andrew. And also, I appreciate the previous speakers. Uh, my first time speaking. I've been listening in a lot. Uh, just to confirm, am I loud and clear? Yes, yes, you are loud and clear. All right, all right. That's great. So, on this point, we're talking about me, myself, and loneliness, embracing emptiness within. Uh, I think I would like to talk about in two or three aspects or maybe one first of all um i think it was a uh, reverend nathan who hinted to the point that being alone is not the same as being lonely those are two different terms and uh, with time people have started to confuse them that when a person is alone they call you lonely yet in actual sense being alone is um i, I think was i don't remember the speaker said solitude i think it was Herbert who said um, solitude yeah solitude it is uh, a sheer will you go through to embrace solitude um, Mr. M Mr. Burali hinted on the point that when we seek and they're asking something from him, well, I think what I learned from, from time is that um, people always love you when, you when you have something to tell them. But also at the same time, you do love yourself when you have something you're offering yourself. Because if you look at it in this perspective, that um, if you don't offer yourself, not, forget about the money, forget about the, the good life that you want. But for example, offering yourself commitment, commitment to your goals, offering yourself um, health, of yourself, um, phys physical problems, you, you, you feel inadequate in your own skin. Unless whereby you also get the notion that I can provide for myself something. That is when you also feel that, yeah, I do love myself more when I can give myself. That you reach a point and you stop blaming people for wanting something from you. Well, it is people. Because also at some point, I too, maybe I would want somebody because he or she is going to offer something to me. Uh, when you look at that in that perspective, it makes you to look, like, that's my own perspective, to look life in a different manner. I mean, like, okay, if I do love myself more when I have something to offer myself, then how am I going to be able to achieve the, that, that momentum of being able to achieve something for myself? First of all, I don't, right now, I'm practicing my guitar. I've had my guitar for over seven years, and I've been very redundant in, in learning it. I've been wishing, seeing, seeing those guitar tutorials, uh, feeling motivated, but never, never, never embracing, like, actually practicing it. Until one, one day I'm like, but Simon, 
Who am I trying to impress? Because I would always brag in my friends that, oh, I have a guitar, I have a guitar. They ask me to play a song. I'm like, bro, bro, I'm not yet there. And then I'm like, Simon, who, who am I trying to improve? Who am I trying to impress? Are you impressing these guys or are you trying to make yourself to do something that you feel proud of? You're trying to give something to yourself. So, and also other factors in, you're yeah, 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 doing a course at times which might feel a bit bulky that was during campus time. And uh, I felt a bit uh, out of place. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't meeting up to the expectations I was portraying to my friends. I wasn't meeting up to the expectations I was portraying to myself. So I had to first step aside. But stepping aside, I think I, I ended up stepping too much aside. It ended up uh, being in a state of, um, I don't say depression because depression is a big word to use, but uh, it felt a bit of lonely. A uh, person asks you, yo, Simon, uh, so what's up with the guitar? And be like, bro, I first left it. And you feel ashamed saying those words. But with time, I searched my soul. I searched uh, my soul and I'm like, what are the goals I want to achieve in life? Which brings me to the point that Reverend Nathan said that we, we tend to go to spiritual leaders for, for comfort, go to church for comfort. But before I go to them, how about me as a person? What have I done to help myself? Because I do believe that the initial helper is myself. Before I seek somebody to help me, I need to first willfully want to help myself. Otherwise, if I can't help myself, then even if I go to, to Mr. Andrew, even if I go to whosoever, they will help me. They will seem like they're helping me and they will do their very best to help me. But in actual sense, their help will be beneficial to me because I myself have not helped myself. I hope I'm, I hope I'm being understood on that point. Um, which brings me to this, to this, this notion that... Um, before uh, you go to any leader, a spiritual leader, any counselor, anyone, you, you, you as a person, me as a person, I matter most. Um, it's not being selfish. It's not being selfish. But it is... It is hello. Changing the am I still on? Yes, 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 still on. All right, I think uh, we lost him there. Apologies for that. It's um, close to 9.30. Um, this is just a note uh, to the ladies on the space. Uh, you can request for the mic and uh, we'll share it. You can request for the mic. You can share your submission during the 9 a.m. hour. Don't feel shy. We are all here to learn from each other and just move away with a positive mind with regards to today's topic. I'll move on to the next speaker. Phil, uh, Phil can you hear me? Uh, Phil? All right. I would love to. Okay, okay, Phil. Uh, so you can go ahead with your submission. Uh, Phil. Are you getting me now? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Please, please proceed. Okay. First and foremost, I want to thank Mr. Chama Girl for this opportunity, and for being consistent with the man Kev. And Pfizer, we are going to fight for not replying your DMs. It's now becoming personal. But I hope. <laughs> Short second there. <laughs> Because, <laughs> man, you reply after like three or two weeks. But I, I hope you can improve on that. Please, we're still having a conversation and we have never concluded it two months later. Anyway, that's not the point. Let's let's get straight to the point of the day. I hope you're still listening to me. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, I would love to thank uh, the previous speakers. And uh, I want to thank Oliver for talking about uh, being lonely. Okay, being lonely and loneliness are uh, two different things. Uh, personally... I love solitude. I really don't. Uh, I, I I love I love being in my own space. But yes, of course, sometimes loneliness will hit you. And uh, the truth is, uh, Oliver spoke about having confidence in uh, only when we are able to provide or when we are able to contribute something. And uh, that was something I really struggled with the past two years. Personally, I'm a giver. Like, I, I love to give, not only on the female side, both on the male and the female side, but I found that I didn't find value when I was, uh, when I was, when I had nothing to give. Sometimes you would find that a friend is down and they need maybe like 20,000 shillings and you cannot help them. You feel off, you feel like a friend who, or you feel like someone who is really not important. And then sometimes uh, someone would want you to bail them with something or you have an arrangement and then you're not able to, to show up or to commit and you really so beat up yourself because you have fallen short. And that brings me to the question of if we are only fulfilled when we are achieving 
what happens when we fall short? And last year I lost my mother, and uh, that was one of the, the toughest times of my life to navigate. And the truth is, okay, yeah, I was, okay, I'm the most responsible student, uh, not student, but child. So there was a lot on me. I had to uh, to take up, like, a lot of responsibilities. You had to make sure you had to handle by your arrangements and the payment of service providers. From there, now you are the one to take care of your siblings who are going to school. And then you have to speak to the elders. You had to do this and that. Now, in between there, I barely had time to grieve. So after all that trackers came down, I, I took a breather. Of course, I had friends who would come and say, hey, uh, if you need to talk, uh, I'm here. Uh, if you need to do this, hey, I'm here. Oh, this and that. But then I didn't know how to talk about it. And uh, I reached a point where I would be in one. People would be like, you're strong. You're doing well. You know, you're okay. No. I